So I'm going to introduce um, Neil Dupree, who has been the chair of this working group, and he can um, introduce the others who are on the panel, and we'll hear what they have to say. Thanks. I thought that she was going to uh, have us all read this together, so take the card out. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll read it together. Sustainable, Sustainable development meets, meets the, the needs, needs of, of the present, present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Okay. So <clears throat> it's a good basic thought to keep in mind uh, no matter what we're doing. I want to uh, add my appreciation to our uh, working group, uh, two of whom are here today, Ethel Himmel and Lois Allen, and there's uh, half a dozen others who couldn't make it for one reason or another today. Um, and before I start with the formal thing, I want to make a couple of announcements. Uh, next Monday, Valentine's Day, at Beloit College, there is a speaker with the topic of teaching for peace and sustainability. Uh, and it would be nice to take a carload down or two to, to see that. Um, and then on April 18th at UW-Whitewater, uh, Bill McKibben is going to be there. And he is the one who has organized the 10-10-10 uh, events uh, this last year. And he's executive of the 350.org uh, group that is really working hard to combat climate change. And uh, I really... I uh, hope that several cars of us can go to hear him because he's really excellent. With that, uh, our uh, sustainability and climate change group uh, have done several things uh, this, this year. Uh, one is we passed out uh, ideas for sustainability at the uh, farmers markets uh, during and at UW Rock <coughs> and other places uh, for 10, 10, 10, uh, October 10th, 19, 10, 2010. Uh, the other thing is we had uh, a series of uh, study circles on the Natural Step uh, community uh, book, and uh, we had probably about 20 to 25 people sign up and continue on through that discussion and had some ideas about what we can do in our own community and uh, are really intending to support the Sustainable Janesville Committee uh, in, in their work. Uh, let me just say that in addition to the definition that we all read together, the natural step system has conditions which uh, talk about, uh, or objectives, one is reducing wasteful dependence on fossil fuels, scarce metals, and minerals that accumulate in nature, uh, but normally are way underground where they can't accumulate. Two, reduce wasteful dependence upon chemicals and synthetic substances that accumulate in nature, things that we human beings uh, create uh, for our own comfort and uh, convenience, but that and uh, accumulate and interact with each other. Reduce encroachment upon nature, uh, which is another way of talking about pollution of all kinds, and meet human needs fairly and efficiently. That's what this group is all about. We are hoping to have another one or two study circles in the near future, and there are a couple of books on the back table that, we, uh, that you could buy or borrow uh, to get a feel for what that is. Uh, last spring we had a book study on the book Hot, Flat, and Crowded by uh, <coughs> Thomas Friedman. And uh, this spring, uh, in March, we're going to have a book study on Aldo Leopold's The Sand County Almanac. Now, all of you have probably read it, but it won't hurt you to read it again. 
And there are copies on the back that I'll be happy to sell people for $10 if you want to get ready for that book discussion. Um, those are some of the things that the, our sustainability working group has done, uh, but uh, it's important to realize that a lot of other people in this community are doing important things also. And so I want to introduce Al Hulick, who is with the city manager's office. He is staff for the Sustainable Janesville Committee, among lots of other hats that he wears. And so I've asked him to say some things about what's going on in the city of Janesville. Sure. Uh, thanks, Neil. As Neil pointed out, my name is Al Hulick. I work for the city of Janesville, and uh, I've worked for the city of Janesville now for just under seven years. By the way, if you can't hear, raise your hand, and it'll uh, be a sign to all of us to talk louder. Sorry. I'll do my best. Uh, I have a little bit of a cold, too, so that's probably going to restrict it a bit. But uh, I've worked for the city of Janesville now for just under seven years, and I've done a variety of tasks with the city of Janesville. I haven't always been in the city manager's office. Um, but I think it's important to kind of put out, uh, to point out some of the things that the city in general uh, has done and is doing. Um, you, you know, Neil has asked me to talk about some of the things that the city is doing today, but I think it's important <coughs> to remember that the city of Janesville has had a long history of doing sustainability practices. They just may not have been, you know, advertised very well or spoken about very well. Uh, for example, curbside recycling. The city of Janesville was one of the first, if not the first, communities in the state of Wisconsin to institute a curbside recycling program. And something that also kind of goes unnoticed in the city of Janesville that's been a long-standing practice is our green belts. Uh, green belts uh, are, are a very sustainable practice in, in how communities are developed. And uh, the city of Janesville's foresight in creating its green belt network throughout the, throughout the majority of the city has really become one of the models for the state of Wisconsin. Uh, as to how, how communities should develop and treat their, uh, treat their open spaces and, and, and their wastewater and stormwater runoff. Um, but that being said, to talk about some of the things today, um, obviously those things were instituted long before my time at the city, and uh, you know, we can still appreciate them today, but it's important to note those. Um, in my seven years with the city, uh, I would say over the last four years, a lot of things have really started to be, come to the foreground. Um, things that uh, are, are, are changing the way that the way that we think as a, as, a, as a community and as an administration and hopefully helping the community change along with us. Um, in, I, I guess one of the things that, that Ali will be talking about a little bit later um, is the creation of the Sustainable Janesville Committee. Uh, that committee was created in 2008 by, by a council policy 81. Uh, the council voted to create that. Um, but along with that, uh, a, a small piece of, uh, I guess, the legislation that was passed before, by the council before that was the eco-municipality resolution. And that eco-municipality resolution really ties into what Neil was talking about with the natural step and those, those four edicts of the natural step. And the council passed that policy and then created the Sustainable Janesville Committee uh, shortly thereafter. And then the Sustainable Janesville Committee has kind of been um, somewhat tasked, for lack of a better term, to kind of uh, make those policies uh, more commonplace in, in the decision-making process. Um, the Sustainable Janesville Committee over the last three years, uh, just under three years, has, has had some successes as of late in, 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 of creating policies within the city of Janesville, changing practices of how we do business, not only in City Hall, but uh, in the community. And, and I'll, I'll let Allie touch on some of those uh, when we get to her time. Um, but things that we do as the city of Janesville, uh, when I say we, I mean the, the administration, the staff. Um, you know, there's been a lot of changes that have taken place over the last couple of years, and probably one of the ones that is, is most recent is a lot of the changes that we've done to our wastewater treatment facility. Uh, as, as some of you may know, that we've undergone a, a tremendous renovation at the wastewater treatment facility, a, a multi-million dollar renovation, and some of the most state-of-the-art practices, sustainability practices, have been instituted into that uh, facility. Um, and if you haven't been down there, it's not completely uh, finished yet, but I know that they're always willing to give tours, and I've been on two or three tours of the facility, and it's, it's a pretty <coughs> impressive facility even before these renovations. But some of the simple things that we've done is, uh, is, is we've constructed solar array panels on, on portions of the new administration buildings, uh, photovoltaic systems that will provide, you know, obvious energy electricity to those, to that, to those new facilities. But some of the more state-of-the-art, um, probably things that uh, people aren't used to hearing is, is uh, 
they've uh, installed micro turbines in the in the affluent, and those micro turbines actually will generate um, energy for the for the facility that either can be used to power the facility or sold back to the Alliant uh, Energy Grid, um, and and those will create energy based on on the processes that take place at the uh, at the wastewater treatment facility. Some of those processes, if again, if you haven't been down there, uh, they create a tremendous amount of heat uh, when they when they process the. Uh, the, the affluent and the wastewater discharges and uh, some of the other practices that they've instituted there is to, is to capture that heat and actually use it to heat uh, their administration buildings and some of their lab buildings uh, and some of their mechanical buildings so um, it's a lot of a lot of new changes down there a lot of uh, state-of-the-art kind of technologies that uh, that can't be found in many other places and really couldn't be found in many other places based on the unique practices that happen at at the wastewater treatment facility um, so that's probably one of the newer um, things that we've instituted. But there's been a lot of changes throughout a lot of the city facilities. Um, I know that they've uh, uh, installed a solar array panel down at Rockport Park, or Rockport Pool, I should say, on one of their building uh, roofs to help uh, generate energy. They've changed a lot of the lighting techniques in a lot of our city garages, including the, the uh, water utility garage down in Delavan Drive and the city services garage out uh, on Highway 51. Uh, where they use where they're using natural light to light those uh, garage facilities as opposed to having these large open space bays with these big arrays of, of uh, fluorescent lightings using a lot of different techniques with with uh, with lighting those large open spaces as well as some of the administration and office buildings at City Hall uh, the city of Janesville is currently undergoing a uh, facility um, audit for lack of a better term where we're having a, a a energy consultant come through the facility and do an audit of that uh, of that building and and look for ways to literally save energy to make improvements within that facility not only to 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 kind of cut down on the electric bill to make but to make it a more effective efficient building for citizens who are there for us staff who are there um, so that's a that's a major undertaking that the council uh, uh, approved uh, I think in late December and then they'll approve that contract here hopefully in the next couple of weeks to get that work done and that work will take place over the next year in the facility it's in the City Hall facility down on Jackson Street itself um, <clears throat> one of the other things that I think is important to point out is uh, under the direction of uh, new I shouldn't say new anymore but new city manager Levitt uh, he created uh, the internal green team which is a volunteer group of city employees who get together to talk about how we can change our practices on a day-to-day -day basis at, at City Hall uh, and hopefully at home as well. Um, and this group has been together now for probably just over a year, um, give or take a month or so, and have already made some changes to the way we, uh, way we do business and how we just kind of go about our day-to-day -day operations uh, within our facilities. Uh, one of the first things that we wanted to make sure we did is that we wanted to make sure that recycling was prevalent throughout all city facilities. Uh, and I know with Julie's help on the Recycle Away From Home program, uh, that we made sure that recycling was, was a part of every facility, whether that be the office buildings that people are used to going and seeing, or the ice arena, or even some of our smaller facilities uh, where, the, where the transit drivers um, wait for their shift change down at the transfer center. Uh, we wanted to make sure that there was recycling containers available in, in all those facilities. Along with that, we've changed the way um, that we actually handle our trash. Um, a trash and recyclables at City Hall in, a, in an attempt to decrease the amount of waste that we have and increase our consciousness to uh, recycling. We've made each, res each individual employee responsible for their own trash and recycling. So if you, if you don't want to take uh, you know, a big load of trash to the, to the, uh, to the central trash bin, uh, you, know, you need to be conscious of what you're, what you're doing at your desk, what you're throwing away. You're not wasting paper. You're not you know, throwing away things that shouldn't be. And it's the same with recycling. So in every floor now, there's one sensual um, recycling and, and waste container um, that's for everybody, uh, all, all the city employees. And, and you empty your own trash, you empty your own recycling, and uh, you know it, it probably discourages us from eating lunch at our desk because <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to have to deal with that. If you, but depending on what you had for lunch, I guess. Um, and another thing that the, uh, that the green team has been uh, pretty instrumental in was, is, is one, that energy audit that I spoke to before. There's a lot of uh, people on the green team are people who work with that day-to-day -day operations, those tech services kind of individuals. But we've, we've tried to, uh, along with that process, go out to other facilities and look for ways. Uh, one simple thing that, that we're looking at is uh, occupancy sensors. 
Um, there's probably nothing more uh, annoying to me personally than when you walk into a, a wide open boardroom that you know hasn't been used for days, if, or, or yeah, probably not days, but hours, and the lights are still on. So we're trying to make an inventory of those, of those commonly but infrequently used for, uh, spaces that, that could benefit from an occupancy sensor while still keeping up to code. Um, so I think that would definitely be something that we will uh, institute over the next uh, probably 12 months, hopefully, in a lot of those places, and then continue to grow that program to maybe um, you know, automatic shutoff valves for, for sinks in the bathrooms or automatic uh, flushes for the toilets in the bathrooms and things like that to grow that program. And we've been able to really utilize grant funding from the federal government, the EECBG dollars. We've been able to stretch those dollars a tremendous amount to get a lot of these projects done that, I, that, I'm, that I've talked about up to this point, including the energy audit and then a lot of other things that we've made available um, to residents in the community, uh, hopefully that they were able to take advantage of, um, and, and then just making improvements to our facilities and how we, how, how we do business. Um, so I, I know that was probably a lot of information, and honestly, if you gave me the rest of the hour, I probably could go on. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it's something that's very important to me, and uh, when, I, when I started at the City of Janesville, it was, it's, it's one of the reasons that I actually even entered this field uh, of prof uh, public administration. And um, former city manager Steve Schaefer looked for volunteers in the organization, and I quickly threw my hand up in the air, and for better or for worse, I've kind of been <laughs> dubbed as maybe the sustainability guy at the City of Janesville. But I, I enjoy it and I appreciate it um, and, and I, I look forward to it and it's a source of pride for me and, and, I, and, I, and I appreciate the support that I get from uh, staff members and from the council and from uh, City Manager Levitt and, and I know that uh, we've only begun and it's going to continue to go from here. So, Thank you. Uh, real quick, what are the four subgroups of the green oh. team? The, the green team, uh, we have a facilities and fleet, that's one. Um, we have an educational subcommittee. Uh, we have a policies and procedures subcommittee, and then we have an environmental subcommittee, which is kind of hopefully that catch-all group uh, that deals with things that are outside of some of those. Uh, one of the things that uh, they've talked about was, is, was wastewater, um, or stormwater, I should say, uh, and, and they look to work with other groups. We have Tim Whitaker on our team, who's the stormwater engineer for the city of Janesville, and he's very active in the Rock River uh, Coalition uh, so he, he, he and uh, some other people who are more of those uh, technically engineer type uh, in mind kind of work with that subcommittee. Uh, but each one of those groups has done, uh, has produced, uh, you know, some things that, that we see, you know, almost on our day-to-day -day basis. So. Okay, good. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so that's from the municipality point of view. And now we move to the business point of view. And Amber Vaughn is... Your produce, produce manager. manager for Basics Cooperative, and you're on. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Amber Vaughn, and I'm the produce manager at Basics, but kind of like in the city, we, we wear a lot of hats also. So um, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters for inviting Basics to come to this. Um, for those of you who aren't super familiar with Basics, we're the Natural Foods Cooperative here in Janesville, which means we are owned by our customers, uh, but we are also open to the public. Well, we are a full-service grocery store. We have um, grocery meat, deli, produce. Um, we also have <coughs> a large selection of natural vitamins and supplements. Um, but as a cooperative, it's really, it is built into our values. Although we are a business, um, it's really built into our values to be a resource for information and also be a good example for sustainability in our community. I think sustainability is kind of a common catchphrase nowadays, but how to actually put it into action is um, the challenge. And... Um, at Basics, we really try to look at everything we do on a daily basis, and we really do try to um, think about how everything we do impacts our environment. In uh, last year, we won the first um, Eco-Friendly Business Award from Forward Janesville, so we're very proud of that. And um, I'm going to tell you about some of the ways that we uh, try to do things on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, first, I have to, of course, mention um, the products that we choose to sell at Basics, which are really the biggest way we choose to support sustainability, not just in our community, but also globally. 
Everything we sell at Basics is natural or certified organic, which means everything is grown without synthetic chem chemical inputs. Um, we support only companies and products that have very minimal impact on the environment. And in fact, companies that are uh, organic certified have a, a positive impact on our, our environment. We also support as much locally grown product as we can and locally manufactured product, which of course the biggest way that helps is to reduce the fuel cost and the, the fuel use. Um, research shows the average American meal has traveled over 1,500 miles to reach our plates, which when you think about it is, is just ridiculous when we have local meat, local cheese, local dairy, uh, crackers, we have just about everything you can need. Um, it just you just have to look for it and we try to be the place that you can come to to find all those things and we have currently probably a couple hundred companies that we support from Wisconsin and we're always actually adding more we're always finding more we love when our customers come in and tell us about their neighbor who has a small <coughs> business um, so that's really really important to us and of course, that's also for our local economy, but um, you know, it has a huge impact when you're reducing that much trucking. Also, um, another thing we encourage at Basics is the use of our bulk department, which means you can bring in your own clean container if you want and reuse it. And so that, of course, cuts down on materials going into the landfill because you're not buying packages of flour and beans and nuts and all those sorts of things. You can reuse your package. And then also the resources that go into the process of packaging itself um, is huge. So we're cutting down on that. Um, so those are really those are really built into who we are as a co-op, which um, which is great, which, you know, that's the type of business that we choose to be. But we realize not everyone can be a natural foods co-op. But we, what we do think every business can do is choose more sustainable ways to operate. And we hope that um, some of the things that we do, um, I kind of want to point out, we're not a huge business. We have, you know, about 40 employees. Um, and but what we do is we try and look at everything we do um, to be eco-friendly on a day-to-day -day basis. So I kind of lost my thought there. But um, here's a few things that we did two years ago. We moved um, from about an 8,000 square foot building into a 15,000 square foot building. And that gave us the opportunity to build in a whole bunch of really fun eco-friendly things into our move. Um, one of the coolest things is our rack system, which actually reminds me um, when he was talking about the wastewater facility um, using the heating and things, it really reminds me of um, how we do our refrigeration in the store. We actually have two generators and two compressors to run all of the refrigerated equipment throughout the whole store. It used to be, um, for example, at our previous store, every piece of equipment had like its own motor. Now we have a room that has this system all built together that runs everything. And um, what it does is the, the heat that it kicks out heats all of our hot water. And then it also heats the building in the winter. And then the, there's even a summer setting that helps keep the humidity down, which is best for the food um, in the summer. Also, all of our equipment that we purchased for the move is Energy Star rated, if applicable, and it's all refurbished. And uh, one thing I want to point out about the refurbished equipment is um, it was actually 25% of the cost that it would have been if we had gotten all new equipment, but it had the exact same warranty. Mm. Um, we just did our research and found, you know, and found a great company. Um, and actually, that company was the farthest away company that we used for the entire move. We used all local contractors and subcontractors, and the farthest company was actually Madigan's Refrigeration of Madison, which did all the refurbishing of our cases and things. So um, I think it's really important to point out that that can be done um, without, you know, uh, going many, many miles away to find companies to do everything. I mean, everything um, was primarily Janesville companies. 
Um, our flooring at the store is made of partially recycled materials and um, we don't ever have to use soaps or chemicals on it. It uh, just washes with water. The paint that we use all over the store is lower no VOC. And what VOC is, I don't know how many people are familiar with that, but it's volatile organic compounds. What they are is, it's the chemicals in a lot of household cleaners and paint and things like that. They actually are released into the air over time, constantly. And um, VOCs are three to four times higher indoors always than outdoors. And research is showing that they, they can cause um, respiratory issues and they may even be implicated in cancer. So what we did, um, and it was obviously that especially worried us, um, because we have a store full of food that people are going to eat, you know, so that would make it even even more scary. So what we did was we did all low or no VOC paint in the store, and we continue to do that. Um, our lighting, um, he was talking about, Al was talking about the motion sensor lights. We did that for all of our back common area rooms because some of them, you know, don't get used for some portions of the day. Um, all of our lighting is recycled. It's all high efficiency. Even our um, our outdoor sign that's lit at night is uh, has a sensor, so it's it has a smart clock, so it responds to the sunlight and such. Um, a lot of people who have been to Basics have probably noticed our big solar panel out front of the store. Um, the solar panel for us generates enough energy to offset all of our lighting in a year. But I did want to point out for uh, a smaller business, a lot of people say, oh, I could never afford, we, our business could never afford a solar panel. That's crazy, it's really expensive. But um, first of all, we did get a several thousand dollar rebate from Focus on Energy. We also got a several thousand dollar tax credit. And as I said, it pays for all of our lighting for the store in a year. And um, it'll pay itself off in seven years. Um, after all of that. So it's really, you know, not as crazy expensive and, uh, you know, unattainable as some people would think. Um, <clears throat> also, we have electric car outlets outside the store, people may have noticed. Um, it sounds crazy to some people. Um, electric cars are not very, you know, uh, widely used yet, but we think they will be. And, um, you know, we want to be the place that uh, people can come to and recharge their cars and so currently we have we know of three customers who do recharge their cars um, in our parking lot and then also one of our produce suppliers is considering purchasing a delivery van that um, they could stop and recharge and we would be their their middle delivery and they could use that also so um, very important to look to the future <coughs> with these things um, and as far as recycling, of course, um, we've always recycled as much as possible. That's always been very, very important to where, you know, that place. You don't dare eat yogurt for lunch and not immediately in front of everyone rinse your container and <laughs> recycle it. <laughs> but um, also, we, we did choose to have our, our recycling done instead of by the city, because the city does recycle, but it doesn't take all the different numbers. Um, we chose Rock Disposal, who takes plastics one through seven. So we actually have uh, three recycling dumpsters outside and one for garbage. And the recycling ones fill up pretty fast. Um, so we, we, as a business, we, we recycle one through seven, but also we're a member of a company called Preserve Plastics, which they make uh, housewares and plates and dishes and things like that. Um, out of all recycled plastic. They also have a program that originally started with only Whole Foods stores where they will recycle plastic number five, which um, is not recycled by most cities. Um, and so we're a drop-off site. So for everybody, and that would actually, the yogurt container is a good example. That's a common container that's plastic number five. And I've talked to a lot of people who didn't realize that the city doesn't take those and they throw them in and then those go in the garbage. So we really encourage everybody to wash first and save your <laughs> <laughs> number fives and then bring them to us and we'll make sure that they really do get recycled. Um, and then again, just as far as looking at everything we do, I think, you know, a lot of businesses can do this. Um, you know, we sell local eggs and 
those local suppliers come in and um, so we ask everybody to save their clean egg cartons and bring them in and that really that really saves them from all going in the trash or recycling hopefully but um, helps those so those farmers don't have to buy more we also save and reuse all of our packaging as far as the boxes that come in we save them for local farmers for shipping their goods they just come in uh, you know whenever they're in town and they pick up a whole bunch of boxes that way they don't have to pay for them that way they're not going into the dumpsters either recycling or the dumpster um, <clears throat> we also save all packing peanuts and the the plastic with the bubbles um, and we either donate them back to UPS or we again give them to local companies who stop in and pick them up or local suppliers of ours um, as far as in the produce department um, and this was since way before I started we save the produce that we pull in the morning like the scratch and dent and all that stuff and we have local farmers who come pick it up out back every morning um, also a couple people who compost but it's mostly farmers with chickens and goats and such so we never have to not never but you know 90 percent of the time we don't have to throw out any of that good organic produce um, even as far as uh, in the deli the our deli manager we haven't quite figured out a compost program for the store it's very difficult with the health codes and and all the regulations and such as far as having you know, a riding pile of food out back. <laughs> it would be kind of difficult. And we have looked into it and we have called the city and, and tried to figure it out. But um, as of right now, our deli manager takes home scraps from, from cooking and composts them at her house. Um, so really it's, you know, from the, the biggest level down to the smallest level, we try and look at everything we do. Um, so that's, that's most of the big things. Um, I'd like to invite everybody who's interested to come on a store tour. We do store tours all the time and you can come in back and see our rack system that heats the store um, and all those things and we can talk a little bit more about the solar panel out front. We can show you there's a computer um, just inside the front door that shows how much energy is being generated by the solar panel like today you can you can go see it so um and yeah thanks again for having us okay well thank you um i'd like to introduce ally roulette um whom i first met in an uh ultimate sustainability situation uh, uh trying to have hens in janesville so that people could have their own eggs etc et uh didn't work but it got her a slot on the Sustainable Janesville Committee, <laughs> which, which is uh, just as important. And uh, she was an active participant in our natural step uh, study circle. So I've asked her to say uh, a few words about uh, the study circles, the uh, Sustainable Janesville, and then her own personal uh, approach to uh, sustainability. Thank Allie? you. Thank you, Neil. Yes, I'm Allison Roulette, and the urban hen keeping opened up an entire world of craziness for me that I never would have thought chickens would do to anybody. But uh, uh, here I am. So, uh, Neil is correct. I did go through the natural step uh, study circle sessions, which was fantastic to be able to meet all sorts of new people that they're all interested in. The common theme that you know that and, and interested in learning about and I guess that's more where I come from is I enjoy learning new things and I've sort of attached in sort of a um, obsessive compulsive disorder sort of way onto sustainability issues and when I discovered that there was a sustainable Janesville committee while I was going through the chicken ordeal um, I, I, I really kind of latched on to that because everything that I had seen and heard before was either through books or on television, the Green Channel, things like that. And then all of a sudden, there's a Sustainable Janesville Committee? It's like, yay, you know. So I, I started following what they were doing um, over a year ago. And to be able to watch their progress as they went through and changed some, you know, changed some things and, and, and the concepts and their own interests, uh, it, was, it was really exciting to see that happen. So when an opportunity came that there was an opening in the committee, I did put in for that, and I was fortunate enough to to get a position on the committee, which is fantastic. I don't know, really know how useful I actually am, but it's fantastic for me, and, and I've enjoyed, uh, I've only been on the committee for a short time, and, and it's been great. 
um, to, to watch the programs that they've been doing since I've been on the committee. The Recycle Away from Home has, has been uh, really in a completion stage, I think. And um, the uh, awards program for, for businesses that uh, show um, just that an interest and, and just that extra effort that they put into their uh, sustainable efforts and their recycling and things like that to be able to commend them for for doing that in the in the city of Janesville and the nonprofit organizations and things like that to be to be a part of that and to watch that happening is, is very cool because I, I sort of felt as a citizen that there really wasn't anything going on you know you, you, you become just yourself looking at things as opposed to realizing that there's a sea of people that are interested in things like local foods and safe foods and community gardens and green belts and all these different things. Chickens. I, I had no idea that I was going to suddenly find all of these people that were interested in wanting to have a few hens in their backyard. I guess I kind of thought it was just me, but apparently not. There's hundreds of them. and So that was spectacular to see all of these people that have an interest in making a change in their personal lives. And that's really where I came from, a sort of a, a taking a step back looking at the things that we have in our house, that we do in our house, just like Al was saying that the city does, and just like Amber's saying that they do at Basics. I was doing that in my house. What can we do? What comes into the house, and then when it has to go out the door, how does it go out the door? And just trying to figure out different means of doing that, and if I had my way, it would get to the point where I would be pretty much self-sufficient in my own home. But the amount of skills that you have to learn, you know, well, where does cheese come from? Where do, you know, you have to make all these things and do all these things, and there's skills that our, our grandparents and great-grandparents had, but not not so much anymore. And that, that has been a focus for me, is sort of a getting back to the basics kind of a kind of a scenario for me. And it's been an immense learning process, and it's that's why I continue to to come to groups like this and, and hear what other people have to say and you know, read be in book sessions and, and things like that is to, to continue the learning process and I think as a, a citizen of anywhere it's important to, to look out and, and say what is progress and what is junk and and to, to really analyze that and, and find out what you can do from your own point of view to be involved with making changes that strike you as obvious so, Yes, that's where I stand on it. Okay. Before we open up to the the uh, audience for questions, uh, maybe Al and, and Ali could say something about what uh, particular <coughs> issues the Sustainable Janesville Committee is working on these days. You want to field that question, Al? Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> back last, uh, I would say spring summer, the the Sustainable Committee met with the with the City Council to kind of go over what are our goals and priorities for the next 12 to 18 to 24 months. Um, and basically we focused on, um, on three specific areas and then one area that Allie just touched on kind of spun off of that and has kind of created a new era. Uh, but first was the Recycle Away From Home program that Julie Backenkeller has been very instrumental Raise in. Raise your hand, Julie. <laughs> we won't get to see on JETV 12, Bill. <laughs> but uh, uh, the Recycle Away From Home program uh, is, is a program that, that Julie has kind of been spearheading for the last, probably over the last year. And basically what it is is it, uh, we're all used to recycling at home, but what do you do with recyclables when you're away from home? Um, so for public buildings, school district, and then hopefully some days businesses, uh, we can get uh, those, uh, recycling be more prevalent in those areas of your life. Uh, so that, that's one major area that the sustainability committee has kind of gone, gone after. Uh, the second was uh, something that kind of came up through the last uh, city council budget discussions was solid waste alternatives. Um, what do we do with the with, uh, ever shrinking landfill and how can we make that situation better? And again, Julie uh, uh, was uh, very instrumental in working with our, uh, with our, with our uh, waste management div division, uh, our, our landfill division, and coming up with some alternatives of how can we make people more conscious of their, of their own personal waste streams. Uh, the third issue, uh, which is one that is kind of ever evolving that hasn't really come to a tremendous amount of fruition yet, but still continues to be talked about is, is developing some sort of action plan, some sort of green action plan for the community, for the city of Janesville, similar to how we have a comprehensive plan. 
that governs how the city is, uh, is to develop for the next 25 to 50 years. We want to have a, a green action plan. How can we sustainable, uh, you know, how can we grow sustainably, sustainably over the next 25 years, more so than what's discussed in the comprehensive plan? And what are some things that we can do to change to make things better with what we have today? Um, what that plan will eventually look like uh, remains to be seen, but we hope uh, it'll be something that is, is new and progressive uh, that can be used by other communities. And then the last item, which has kind of been an offshoot that Ali touched on, is this uh, Sustainable Janesville Awards program, where we're looking to recognize individuals, businesses, and uh, um, not for, yeah, organizations, not-for-profit groups, for being leaders in the community in their sustainability efforts. Um, that's that's a, a program that's actually going to go to before the council on February 14th, so next Monday, uh, for council approval, and we hope to kick that program off shortly thereafter, and then we'll have our initial awards uh, presented, hopefully to the nearest council meeting to Earth Day, so that would be April 11th. Uh, that's that's the plan, uh, and we'll get council's input on on Monday night, and then the sustainability committee meets the following night, uh, Tuesday the 15th. Uh, to kind of finalize that plan, hopefully, and then we'll get it rolling probably within the next week thereafter. Uh, but if anybody's interested, the Sustainability Committee meets every third Tuesday of the month uh, at City Hall in room 416, which is the big room right next to Council Chambers. So every third Tuesday at 6.30, City Hall in room 416 up, up on the fourth floor. Um, I, I think that probably well, well answered your question yes. and beyond. <laughs> yes, it did. Okay. Uh, Questions from from the audience? Andrea. Uh, one question. The, there's a federal food um, regulation trends that are coming our way, and some people that have been talking to me are concerned that it could lead to requiring us to have licenses to be able to plant a garden or that it would and or eliminate potlucks and bake sales. And I was wondering if to me, that would interfere with sustainability and growing your own food. And I'm wondering if you're aware of that at all or, and have any type of response or concern. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question. Okay. Uh, do, I understand the question to be, are the new federal regulations regarding food safety uh, going to uh, negatively impact things like potlucks and community gardens? Is that your question? Thank you, yes. Anybody know? I haven't heard anything at the federal level, no. Yeah, it would cer if, if that was the case, it would certainly impact uh, what we're trying to do, but I haven't heard of any legislation that, that would be along those lines. I know we as a business, um, there's a lot of regulations as far as um, we can have a potluck where we invite our co-op members because they are part owners of the business, but we cannot have a potluck where just the general public is invited and have it on our business because then we would be liable for any any foodborne illness outbreak. So there's definitely a lot of regulations we follow. We mostly deal with um, the county for for a lot of the food regulations, just the standard county food business regulations. I haven't, so that's probably why we haven't heard anything specifically handed down by the federal government. Julie, did you have some input? Well, I've read about that federal. I've read about that, and I don't think that the, the planting your own garden thing is something that would ever happen just because it defies common sense. And um, basically, um, there's a lot of communities, like let's say the city of St. Paul, um, their school district, you're not allowed to bring food in that was made in your home kitchen. It has to be something that was bought in a store that's, you know, wrapped, etc., that kind of thing. And the whole policy behind it is food safety and, uh, you know, knowing where the food comes from. But the, the portion of it, which I read about, which, which had to do with the home garden kind of thing, to me was just preposterous. And I can't imagine that it would ever go through. So we'll, we'll keep our ears peeled for, uh, for this kind of thing. Um, next question, please. I would just comment that any facility um, I assume in Rock County that has a commercial kitchen license, like and the case I can relate to is our senior center in Melton, that it is now licensed with a commercial kitchen, which therefore means no home baked food or whatever can be brought in. It has to come from another uh, commercially licensed uh, food service. Okay, so. Or, 
weeks. <laughs> um, you know, but yeah, but we cannot, and that bothers some of the participants because, you know, maybe on their birthday when the knitting group gets together, they want to bring goodies, can't do. And if we have a funeral luncheon where lots of times people want to donate food, that can't be done either. So it does put a different style into how you operate. So in, in case the, it didn't pick up for the JATV, uh, the point is that uh, commercially, kitch, commercially licensed Licensed. kitchens are not permitted to bring food in from the outside. They can make the food there, but not bring yes, it in they from can outside. Make it in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, but otherwise, if they bring in food, it has to be from, it has to come from another licensed kitchen. Okay. Or facility. Uh, let's let's not uh, spend the whole time on this. I trust that I you have a, a different question. I have a question of, uh, Mr. Joy. Uh, has the city considered expanding uh, the recycling of plastics to include other than the one and two that you now have? Which that uh, it's nice, but I mean, basics isn't exactly convenient to me. Right. So. Yeah, they have looked into it. I know that uh, I've spoken with our operations department, and they've, they've talked to me about. Uh, they're continuing to look for. Uh, haulers that will would, would take that um, the city of Janesville contracts for their recycling uh, you know we don't have our own recycling facilities through waste management and waste management doesn't take plastics three through seven and they've continued to look work with waste management to find outlets for those because it really comes down to a market that's available uh, I mean it, it's it's a business um, and when there's no market available uh, or at least a profitable market available to, to an entity to for plastics three through seven, uh, from a business standpoint, they, they, they don't have any use for them. So the city of Jaisal has continued to work with waste management and continue to look for other haulers that would take a three through seven. Uh, but at this point, it's, it just it hasn't really come to fruition, unfortunately. Uh, so it's, it's always good to know that there's other folks out there that, that there are options available. But I, as far as a curbside, Homes, household to household, it, it just doesn't exist yet. The question I was going to ask Amber is, do you really know whether Rock Disposal recycles all those, <laughs> or do they just end up in the landfill anyway? My understanding is if they are clean, you know, um, that yes, they do get recycled. Okay. <laughs> so, all right, yes. I'm wondering if there's any listing anywhere of, of responsible ways to recycle certain things like it takes a lot of research sometimes on the internet to find out where to take things um, I, I just bought a new toaster oven to replace one that's broken is there uh, a way I can find out the most responsible way to recycle the old one uh, TVs computers printers um, other metal kind of things. We're looking for a resource list of places that we can recycle uh, non-functional things uh, such as toaster ovens at, at, and TVs. Do we, does anybody here have any thoughts? If, if you call out to the City Operations Division, 755-3110, uh, uh, they generally should be able to point you in the direction of where those where those items can go, um, and you know a lot of a lot of the questions I know they get are what do I do with my light bulbs? What do I do with my old batteries? Um, and they can they're they're usually a really good resource to point you in that right direction for what to do with those uncommon pieces of trash. <laughs> and that may be something that Stainville Janesville could uh, come up with. Repeat the number, please. Seven five five three one one zero. And that's just the that's the op city's operations department out there on Highway 51, and they can either you know send you back to Mandy Bonneville or Pete Riggs or one of those other folks if, if they can't answer the question right up front. The folks that are in charge of the of the, the landfill facility uh, should be able to get you pointed in the right direction probably nine times out of ten. Okay. If there was could that list be put on your website, so it's <clears throat> easily accessible. I or yeah. Or in the paper. Yeah, I I. I think there may be some sort of list somewhere on our website right now, but I don't want to say for sure. I know that the sustainable committee uh, was was working towards that, and I remember when Lindsay was with us, um, 
we, we did put together some sort of list like that, and I thought she posted it, but I can't remember to what extent that list covered. There's also a website, and I can't think of the name of it right now, but if you type in, just in Google, Recycling Resources, you'll get, uh, there's, there's one website where you can just type in what you have, and your zip code, and it'll tell you what to do with that item. So Google Recycling Resources. Right. Okay, yeah. that's another way of doing it. Billy Bob. Yeah, um, for the sustainability committee, have you guys ever taken a position or wrote a pos uh, position paper on our city's ever-growing need to expand in, out of our city limits? Um, okay, this, the Sustainable Janesville position on uh, the city's growing geographically. Is that what you're asking yeah, about? The approach they have a growing encroachment on our farmland. Uh, <coughs> they drive around lately on the west side, you know, on the north side. And, uh, we want to protect the east side for sure, but I mean, we, we just keep going. Okay, in two minutes. Uh, Julie, you want to field that question? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I can answer it in, in probably two seconds. No, they, they, they never have. Um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the economy has kind of taken care of that for us over the last couple of years. Uh, but that was one of the charges that the Sustainable Committee tried a couple of years ago was to was to get more of a footprint in the comprehensive plan as far as where how do we grow, where do we grow, and then how do we limit growth. And uh, I would say that that's hopefully one of the offshoots from the Green Action Plan initiative that I spoke about earlier. So it's coming, but it's hopefully not not here yet. Okay, uh, one more quick question. We got one minute left. A quick question for Amber. Maybe um, if the goal is to eat more local food to get that average mile per plate down from 200 miles to 20 or 50, how, what are the challenges of basic seeds for us to eat more local food from the supply or demand side? Sure. Um, Eating local food, what are the challenges? I would say one of the largest challenges is the climate in Wisconsin. A lot of people, I mean, it's very, very expensive to heat a greenhouse in Wisconsin, or we would have a lot more. We luckily do have a couple of suppliers who have received grants to heat their greenhouses, and so they at least can do so for maybe not the dead middle of winter, but they can extend the growing season. A little bit in either direction. Um, I would say that's certainly one of the biggest challenges. Um, it's another challenge also the uh, advertising and getting the word out. The really small companies, um, you know, they're not putting their commercials on TV where your kids can see them and then your kids say I want to eat this, you know. Um, I would say those are, those are a couple of the challenges. The biggest challenge would have to be, I think, the climate. We do, because we do have so many resources. Um, we have the farmer's market. There are plenty of uh, community-supported agriculture programs around here where you can um, have an agreement to get a share box from, directly from the farmers. Um, we're fortunate in that way that we are in kind of a, a rural area. Um, but you know, it's so I can think of another challenge that goes along with that, and that is helping people know how to preserve food during the summer, Absolutely. so they can put it in their freezers and eat it during the winter. And we do try to cover that in workshops. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, definitely in the fall, um, watch for workshops on canning and preserving. Um, also, you know, fermenting your own food. Um, all the things like that that go along with that. We have a community room that's free for use if anybody themselves would like to teach or knows of someone who would, who would like to lead a class. We have plenty of open space um, for open times that people can do classes and all you really have to do is call up and um, fill out a little sheet to let us know, you know what your plans are and we have a full kitchen in the community room and like I said, it's, it's free to use, so that's a great resource. Okay, thank you to Allie and Amber and Al, and um, we'll turn it back to Kay. Well, thank you very much, all thank of you. you, for <laughs> Typically, we never leave immediately, so if you have questions that you want to uh, address to any of these individually, feel free to do that. 
Um, I, there aren't many cookies left, but help yourself and make sure you pick up any of those notices about upcoming things that are happening. And thank you again for coming. And uh, March is redistricting, and April is Medicare fraud. So we'll look forward to seeing you then.